right, the last part of this lecture here. This is on rabies. We're going to do kind of a quick overview of uh, several RNA viruses. We talked in depth about influenza and HIV, but we'll do a quick overview of some of these other ones. Rabies is first. Rabies is part of the rhabdovirus family. Uh, a couple of interesting things about rabies. The first being its shape. It has a very distinctive shape. You can see in this picture the shape of rabies. It's, it's a very kind of bullet-like shape. Very unusual, really identifiable. When you see a picture of, of, a, of the rabies virus, you know that that's what it is because of that bullet shape. That always helps me to remember it because uh, if you're from my generation, there was a movie called Old Yeller that was about rabies. Uh, and in the end, it ended with a bullet, which will help you to remember rabies is bullet shaped. Now this virus is a zoonotic virus. It is found in wild mammals and it's passed to humans via a bite. Um, the saliva from the bite will pass it to humans. We find rabies in lots of different wild mammals, including skunks, bats, foxes, coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, etc. So we found them. Uh, this virus is found in lots of different wild mammals and it can be spread to humans via a bite. Now the rabies disease is very interesting. The rabies disease is incredibly slow. Uh, it's a very slow, progressive disease. It's going to start out at the tissue site and then slowly move through the nervous system, which is really unusual and is going to allow an interesting treatment ability. So rabies, again, really unusual uh, in, in the fact that it's such a slow progression for the disease. It, a virus enters at a bite site. It will then grow at that trauma site for a week or so and then slowly enter into the local nerve endings and advance towards the, um, the central nervous system, towards the ganglia, spinal cord, and brain. And then it will be shed in the human saliva just like it was shed in the animal's saliva. Now because we're talking about um, damage to the nervous system, symptoms include damage to the nervous system, so agitation, disorientation, seizures, twitching, paralysis, etc. Those sorts of things, things that are associated with uh, central nervous system damage. Sometimes you see other effects like fever or vomiting, um, headache, um, but the main ones would be anything dealing with the central nervous system. Now unfortunately, uh, the, the infection, once it gets to the brain, the encephalitis that, that comes about is almost always fatal. Uh, people generally die of rabies infections, just like animals generally die of rabies infections. In fact, it's often diagnosed at autopsy. Um, you, if you have a suspected rabies case, you can take uh, tissue samples from the brain or spinal column and you can look for what are called negri bodies. You can see that here. These negri bodies that you find in nervous system tissue, um, you can identify as indications of a rabies infection. So the term negri bodies is diagnostic for a rabies infection. Uh, you see that at autopsy. Now interesting. Remember I told you how slow this infection is. It's very slow to progress starting in the tissue and moving towards the central nervous system. In fact, it is so slow, this infection is so slow, that we can vaccinize you, vaccinate you post-exposure. So if you got bitten and we think you might have been exposed to rabies, we can actually give you your vaccine post-exposure and you will go ahead and, and make your immune response and be able to defend yourself before rabies actually gets to your nervous system. This is one of the few places where we can do that. Generally, you have to have been vaccinated before exposure, but rabies allows post-exposure immunization. Really cool, very unusual. So if you get um, bitten, you want to make sure you go in and get that rabies vaccine. Not only can they give active post-exposure immunization, we can also do passive, i.e. we can give you antibodies. If we think you've been exposed, we can give you antibodies um, in order to help protect you as well. So, interesting. It's so slow that we can actually vaccinate you after exposure. Now, rabies 
almost always fatal. Um, really, it's essential that in this country, if you get bitten by a wild animal, you have got to go and get checked out because they need to make sure that you haven't been exposed to rabies. And if you may have been exposed to rabies, they're going to vaccinate you and give you uh, some antibodies to protect you in the meantime because it is almost always fatal. So you just, you don't mess around with it. I always tell people that if you get bitten by a wild animal, and you can easily trap that wild animal without getting bitten more, then, then go ahead and do that because they can test the animal for rabies. And if the animal doesn't have rabies, they don't need to, to vaccinate and treat you. Um, but if, if you can't get a hold of the animal or the animal tests positive, you need to make sure you go in and, and uh, have them look for possible early signs of rabies um, and possibly do the vaccination. Some parts of the world don't have rabies in them. Uh, Australia, Hawaii, New Zealand, Great Britain are all rabies free. They very tightly regulate um, bringing animals onto those, those different islands because they're trying to keep it rabies free. Uh, so, so that's why they're so tight with their uh, bringing pets, policies for bringing pets and things like that onto the island. So again, rabies, always, always, always go in for treatment if you get bitten by a wild animal. Some more uh, viruses I want to talk about here. A common vaccine that we get called the MMR. MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, I'm going to talk about the three viruses that are involved there with that vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella. First here is the measles virus. The measles virus is extremely contagious in respiratory droplets. Uh, it is, usually causes a rash. Generally, this is mild. It's usually a mild childhood infection, but um, you can wind up with serious complications. Here you can see a picture of the measles rash. I always think it looks like a speckled rash, if you look at that, sort of um, reminiscent of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, kind of speckled looking rash. Anyway, that's the measles rash. Again, generally mild. Um, we do vaccinate people because complications are possible, even dangerous or deadly complications are possible. Sometimes people get encephalitis. They get brain damage from measles. Uh, so it is definitely worth vaccinating against because although it's generally mild, it could be very serious if you're one of the few who get the complications. Now, that speckled rash, the measles virus rash, it's kind of tough to to tell uh, the speckled rash versus other rashes. Uh, so one of the things, so as you're going through, if you, if you have a, a question or a case study or a patient that has a rash, um, what sorts of things can you do to help you figure out what rash this patient has? Of course, you want to know about their vaccination background because uh, we routinely vaccinate against measles, so you wouldn't expect a vaccinated person to have measles. But something else that would help you to identify if that rash is measles. Notice on the inside of the cheek, see these white spots? If the patient has measles, on the inside of the gums and on the cheeks are these white spots. They call them coplix spots. K-O-P-L-I-C-K. Coplix spots. Um, after the guy who identified them. One of the ways you can check to see if it's measles is you can, you know, if you have a patient with a rash, you ask about their vaccination history and you look at the inside of their mouth and you're looking for coplex spots to help you identify that it's measles as opposed to a different kind of rash. All right. Another here, uh, so the MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. Let's talk about the mumps virus. The mumps virus particularly infects the salivary glands. That's its uh, particular location of infection. So it infects the salivary glands and they swell up huge in response and it is supposed to be extremely painful. Which sort of makes sense if you think about where your salivary glands are. If they were to get infected and hugely inflamed, there's not very much tissue there. So, so it would be extremely painful to have that inflammation in the salivary glands. And that's what you're seeing here. Notice on the left side of this girl's cheek is normal. On the right side, look at all that inflammation from the infected salivary gland. And obviously she looks like she's in pretty intense pain. So mumps virus ten, uh, infects specifically the salivary glands. It is acquired through respiratory droplets. 
Uh, it is relatively benign except for the pain associated with the swelling. Uh, full recovery is expected. The problem is sometimes the mumps virus can invade other organs. Sometimes it can move to other parts of the body, uh, including testes and ovaries. So there have been cases of reduced fertility and even sterility if the mumps virus moves to the testes or the ovaries. Now usually it doesn't go to both testes or both ovaries, so you don't usually see complete sterility, but perhaps reduced fertility. So for mumps here, infects the salivary glands. We worry about it spreading to places like the testes and the ovaries. It is uh, quite painful, but not usually giving long-term complications. So that's the mumps. So for MMR, we have measles, mumps, and rubella. Rubella, also a relatively benign rash. Um, and it's a mild illness, illness for both children and adults. So, you know, whether it's a child uh, or an adult who gets rubella, it's really quite benign. Um, I always think it looks like the chicken pox rash, sort of. You see the individual pox there on this, on this infant. Um, rubella sometimes, by the way, is called German measles. Sometimes they call rubella German measles, same thing. So it's not really that serious. It's a, it's a relatively benign rash and mild illness for kids or adults. The problem with rubella, the reason we vaccinate against rubella, is if a pregnant woman gets infected by rubella, it causes very serious birth defects. So if mom is gestating, carrying the, the baby, um, if she becomes infected in the first trimester, generally that um, causes a miscarriage. If mom becomes infected in the second or third trimester, then we're talking about serious mental, physical, or developmental defects in the baby. So rubella is really not a big deal for kids or adults. It's a really big deal for gestating fetuses. Feti. Fet however you would plurally say fetus. Anyway, so that's where, where we would worry about it. We would worry about it for pregnant women. So the reason we vaccinate against rubella is, is really to protect um, developing fetus. Uh, fetuses. Anyway, I need to move on because I'm getting obsessed with that. All right, so that's measles, mumps, and rubella, that very common vaccine um, that we give to, to kids in order to protect them against all three. The next topic I want to talk about, ooh, the handful of viruses that fall under this category, are the so-called common cold viruses. Um, we periodically get colds, um, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, the common cold is a non-specific term. Generally, the common cold is caused by some sort of virus. Now there's lots of different viruses that can cause that, can cause a cold. A cold being an upper respiratory tract infection. Now there's a, a, a lot of different organisms that can cause upper respiratory tract infections, the so-called common cold. We talked about one already, that was influenza. I remember influenza is the cause of the flu, but if it's a benign combination of H's and N's, it can look like a common cold, and so sometimes it's just the flu that's causing the cold. Other organisms, other viruses that can cause this common cold, this upper respiratory tract infection, the parainfluenza virus. Parainfluenza is very similar to influenza, but it's much less pathogenic usually stays to the upper respiratory tract infection, uh, stays in the upper respiratory tract. It's usually not uh, terribly pathogenic. It's generally self-limiting and relatively benign, right? People will get over it. So it can cause the common cold in both kids and adults. Sometimes young kids will develop what they call croup from the parainfluenza virus. Croup means labored breathing. Usually it has to do with so much uh, mucus production in the upper respiratory tract that the patient has trouble getting air in and out of their, their lungs. So the croup um, is a term that means labored breathing, and sometimes young kids especially could develop that from parainfluenza. Another virus that can cause the common cold, the respiratory syncytial virus. Um, in both children and adults, the respiratory syncytial virus causes a cold. 
in newborns and babies, this is, can be much more severe. In newborns and, and very young children, it can result in bronchitis and even pneumonia from respiratory syncytial. Uh, so sometimes you see it in the really, really young kids, and it can even be deadly in some cases with uh, respiratory syncytial virus. causes about 4,500 deaths per year in infants. Um, so unfortunately, it's one of the most common viral diseases in infants, but it can cause uh, serious complications and even death from uh, respiratory problems. Respiratory syncytial virus is more common in the winter. Uh, and in fact, this one is interesting. It appears that it's more common in the winter regardless of temperature. So it's not the same association we saw with influenza. Uh, with influenza, I was telling you that it only seems to be common in the winter because we're inside breathing recirculated air. But respiratory syncytial doesn't seem to be the same. So very strange. They haven't figured out why yet. Then there's an even more benign... Um, cause for the common cold without serious side effects. Those are the rhinoviruses. Uh, the rhinovirus causes the common cold in both children and adults. Um, it can be easily transferred on fomites, so snotty tissues and doorknobs and, and sharing cups and stuff like that transfers rhinoviruses very, very easily. So all ages can get rhinoviruses and it causes just a cold, not a big deal. But it does live for hours on fomites, meaning that you can easily transmit it uh, from person to person, even without seeing the other person, if you're sharing something like a glass. So when people ask the question, if we have a strong active immune system, why is it that we get so many colds? Theoretically, why do we get colds? Our immune system should learn how to fight that virus and it should never be a problem again. Well, the reason you get so many colds, the average is two a year, is because there's several different strains of parainfluenza, several strains of respiratory syncytial, and 110 different strains of rhinoviruses. So even if you have been infected by a couple of rhinoviruses and maybe the respiratory syncytial virus at some time in your life, there's still a whole bunch of them out there ready for you. So you actually do get protection from your immune system. There's just so many things that can cause the cold that uh, it, it, it's ineffectual. You, you are still um, able to get a cold later because there's so many different pathogens that can cause the common cold. Another very common uh, virus to cause infections in humans, this is rotavirus. Uh, rotavirus infects the intestines and can cause severe diarrhea and weight loss. Um, this is actually a very, very common infection all over the world, including the United States. They believe that it causes about 50% of all cases of diarrhea worldwide are caused by a rotavirus. And it kills about 600,000 children every year, this particular infection. Now, kids in the United States get rotavirus as well. Um, but what happens is babies in the United States, little kids in the United States, uh, tend to be fat, happy, healthy infants. And so if they get the rotavirus, they get a raging case of diarrhea, but then they'll get over it. Uh, when we talk about infants in other parts of the world, infants in parts of the world where they may already be malnourished, if they get the rotavirus, then that is life-threatening diarrhea. If the baby isn't fat, healthy, and happy, uh, they, they can get severe diarrhea that could be deadly uh, in other parts of the world. So rotavirus generally is relatively mild in the United States, although it's quite common. Um, but because our infants are so, so um, healthy to begin with, they're able to survive this infection relatively easily. But it can be really serious in other parts of the world. So living conditions have everything in the world to do with rotavirus severity. Generally what they'll do to treat it is replace fluids and give electrolytes. So you'll put your kid on Pediasure and make sure that they're staying well hydrated um, and, and getting plenty of vitamins. Now this is a common cause of diarrhea, especially in children. Um, there's another one that's been getting a lot of press recently, so I added it to the list a couple of years ago. Norwalk agent. Norwalk agent uh, was first called Norwalk agent because it was identified in Norwalk, Ohio. There was an outbreak there. Um, this is an enteric virus found in mammals, including humans. Um, they think that it probably causes about one-third of all viral gastroenteritis cases. 
Uh, it's particularly found in, in locations where people are living in close contact. Um, it is transmitted via the oral fecal route. So you get this by ingesting uh, contaminated food or water. Uh, and so you see this again associated with people living in close contact, sharing a common water source, sharing common food sources. So the big outbreaks that we keep hearing about are cruise ship outbreaks, where Norwalk agent gets into the water supply of the cruise ship and all of a sudden all of these people have uh, viral gastroenteritis. You see it occasionally in school outbreaks or day camps or nursing homes. Um, you see Norwalk agent outbreaks. And again, it's, it's uh, because of ingestion of contaminated food or water. Um, but usually you see it in a great big outbreak like that because of how it's acquired. Usually people sharing a food or water source. The next group here, the arboviruses. Um, the arboviruses, this is kind of a strange term. The term arboviruses are used to describe viruses that are spread by arthropod vectors. So anything, any virus that's spread via mosquitoes, ticks, flies, gnats, etc., we would call an arbovirus. Right? That's what that term means. It's, it's spread from, by an arthropod of some type. Now this is a large group of viruses. They fall into many different families. I've listed some of the families there. Please do not memorize all of those different virus families. What I'm trying to get across to you is the idea that arbovirus is not a family. They're just sort of tossed into this group called arboviruses if they are spread through an arthropod vector, if they're spread by some kind of um, mosquito, tick, fly, etc. Now, interesting. We can see um, really clear patterns with arboviruses. Most of the illnesses that are caused by these viruses are mild fevers. That's what usually happens, is it's a mild fever of some sort. But some of them can, can cause severe encephalitis and some cause a hemorrhagic fever. I'm going to go through an example of each of these uh, on the next slide. But again, these are all arboviruses transferred by some sort of arthropod vector. So here I'm kind of showing you the different levels. Uh, some cause a mild fever with a rash, relatively mild uh, arbovirus. Some will cause encephalitis where the central nervous system is involved and some can cause a hemorrhagic fever where there's bleeding and shock. This is a picture showing you different parts of the world what kind of arboviral infections they worry about. Remember, because arboviruses depend on some kind of an arthropod vector, they are specific to certain parts of the world, and that's dependent uh, totally on what the vector is, right? It, it will only, that infection will only be found where the right species of tick is, or will all, that infection can only go forward where the right species of gnat is whatever it is for that particular virus. So you can see the map is showing you very specifically where you see certain kinds of arboviral infections and it's very specific based on the habitat of their vector. So if we look at a couple of examples here, I'm showing you a couple, of, uh, one or two examples from each of these groups. Most of the arboviruses cause a relatively mild fever that may have a rash. Um, no long-term damage done to it. In the United States, the most common of these mild fevers caused by an arbovirus is called Colorado tick fever. Um, and you get it from a tick bite, which is why they call it Colorado tick fever. Uh, it's, it's really quite a benign infection. Um, patients will come in often if they see the rash, but it's relatively benign, goes away on its own, no long-term damage associated with Colorado tick fever. Now, we also have some more serious arboviral infections. So now I'm going to tell you about some that cause encephalitis. Encephalitis, the central nervous system is involved, and that can be much more serious. Um, so some of them can, can be kind of fluish, but they can develop into encephalitis. So the one that's most common in the United States that falls into this group is called St. Louis encephalitis. St. Louis encephalitis is the most common found in the United States. It's transferred via mosquitoes. Um, and it, it generally causes flu-like symptoms, 
feeling tired and achy, but it can go to the central nervous system and cause encephalitis and even death. Now, one very close relative to St. Louis encephalitis that we have heard more about, although it's not as common, is called West Nile. West Nile is one of these um, encephalitis, uh, encephalitis, uh, encephalitis infection that can be caused by an arbovirus. So West, the West Nile virus um, can cause it. Again, transferred via mosquitoes uh, and, and generally causes flu-like symptoms for most people, but about 1% of adults will develop into encephalitis. So the vast majority of people will be, um, will be fine, but 1% of patients do develop this brain uh, involvement in West Nile. Now, in this country, how do we think about controlling something like St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile? You've seen the public service announcements. You know how they're trying to control it. They're trying to control the mosquito population. We know this is transferred by mosquitoes, so they're trying to get you to get rid of standing water, or trying to get you to wear insect repellent, all of the things that we know will reduce your exposure to mosquitoes, since we know that that's how St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile is acquired. All right, some um, much more serious forms of infections that can come from arboviruses. These are hemorrhagic fevers. Um, hemorrhagic fevers, that's when you have bleeding from multiple body sources, multiple different sources, which is going to cause shock, drop in blood pressure, almost always deadly. Extremely dangerous infections. These are the hemorrhagic fevers. We used to have yellow, yellow fever in this country. Um, yellow fever used to be seen, especially in the uh, southeastern portion of the United States, like around Louisiana, was always the hot spot for yellow fever. Um, you got this from uh, a mosquito bite, and you would wind up with flu-like symptoms, but possible hemorrhagic fever, where literally your body begins to bleed from all body orifices. Uh, really nasty infection. Now, we got rid of yellow fever in the United States through vector control by killing off the mosquito species that was harboring yellow fever, draining out swamplands, those sorts of things to get rid of the mosquitoes. Um, that's how yellow fever has been cleared from this part of the world, but it is still found in other parts of the world. You do still see yellow fever showing up in other places. Other examples of these uh, hemorrhagic fevers, dengue fever is, is notoriously problematic. Dengue fever is seen in uh, parts of Central and South America. Uh, dengue fever is supposed to be so incredibly painful that uh, patients feel as if their bones are breaking, so sometimes it's called break bone fever. Sounds truly horrific. Uh, it's supposed to be an incredibly painful infection, and what's happening is literally the body is liquefying, um, and, and then you're bleeding out uh, through these hemorrhagic fevers. Another, another one we're hearing a lot about now, Ebola, or its relative Marburg, those two viruses. Uh, Ebola and Marburg are found in parts of Africa, and what happens is patients uh, get infected by Ebola or Marburg, and they literally, they liquefy, and um, blood starts coming out of all body orifices. Um, everything you can think of and then some. Blood comes out from eyes, ears, nose. Uh, it also will come out of tear ducts and sweat glands and literally your insides leak out of you. It's a really horrific death. Um, the only saving grace for something like Ebola and Marburg is the fact that patients don't survive very long. And because they don't survive very long, they don't survive to uh, infect other people. So our one good news with something like Ebola or Marburg is that patients die really fast, which means they can't infect others. Um, so that's kind of a sad uh, upside to Marburg. All right. A virus that we do see in the United States and that can cause really serious infections, here's hantavirus. Now, hantavirus is an interesting one. It was recognized relatively recently. In 1993, uh, the CDC became aware of several cases of people around the Four Corners area, so here in the American Southwest. Um, they came, became aware of several cases of apparently healthy people dying of respiratory arrest. Uh, and respiratory problems. And so they go in, they start to investigate, and they found that it was 
uh, a hantavirus. So hantavirus is a group of viruses. None were known to exist in the United States, but when they found this one, they gave it the name Sinombre, which means no name. So the actual name of the virus is the Sinombre virus, and it's in the hantavirus group. It's the only hantavirus found in the United States, and they commonly call it hanta. Um, but it is actually, the particular virus that we're talking about is called the Sinombre virus. Now, this virus is carried in the gastrointestinal tract of wild rodents uh, in the American Southwest. So what happens is it's released in their feces. Um, so wherever the wild rodents are, they release this hantavirus in their feces. And then you inhale dust that has the dried rodent feces in it, and it causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, this lung infection uh, by hantavirus. Now, you may think to yourself, when do I ever inhale rodent feces? Well, remember, rodent feces turn into dust very quickly, and you inhale dust all the time. Now, hantavirus is extremely pathogenic. It causes this hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, high fever, pulmonary failure, very high death rates, 33% of patients die from hantavirus infections, extremely deadly. It's one of the few things that can bring down a strong, healthy individual. When we talk about respiratory infections, remember the vast majority of them are dangerous to the very young and to the very old or immunocompromised. Hantavirus will bring down the strong, healthy individual too. It's a very, very very terrible disease and it will bring down anyone very high death rates. So Hanta you have to worry about anywhere where there could be rodent feces right? um, and, and the particular species that carry this this Hanta virus are found all over this part of the United States. So generally this is a problem if you're in like old abandoned cabins or you're sweeping out your your garage or some those sorts of things is where you worry about hantavirus, places where there could be rodents living and, and uh, leaving their feces around. For example, my dad has a side business where he um, works in old abandoned caves and mine shafts. Um, and he's doing various things there to protect the local bat population, but in those those caves and mine shafts, you're definitely going to have rodents out there, um, and in their feces is hantavirus. So he has a solution that he sprays over the whole area before he works that has uh, a bleach solution in it, and it does two things: one, bleach will kill hanta, and two, it's actually wetting down the whole area so that you don't have dust to inhale because you get this by inhaling it. So if you had some suspicion that Hanta could be around, you want to mop. You don't want to sweep because you don't want to get dust into the air and then inhale those dried rodent feces. It's much safer to mop it up in a wet solution and then you don't have the possibility of inhaling it. So Hanta, really serious problem in the America, uh, American Southwest area, including California. Polio. Uh, the polio virus here. Polio we used to worry about tremendously in this country, but now you don't acquire it in the United States any longer. Uh, the polio virus is ingested. You get this by ingesting fecally contaminated food or water. Um, and in fact, the polio virus can survive through stomach acids. Many viruses can't, but polio can. Now, polio has a whole bunch of different possibilities. I like this picture because I feel like it's showing you all of the different possibilities for polio virus. Um, when you ingest polio virus in infected food or water, the vast, for the vast majority of people, polio will go right through you, may cause some diarrhea on the way, out the other side. Right? So for most people, it could be a gastroenteritis um, that you'll get from polio. That's the vast majority of patients, but there are other possibilities. It is possible that the virus can spread. It can, so you drink it in, it is possible that it will be absorbed by the mucosa of the back of the throat and go straight to the brain. Right? That's very dangerous. It's also possible that in the intestinal tract, it will get absorbed into the bloodstream and lymph system and wind up in the spinal cord. Right? Those are possible complications with polio. Now, the vast majority of people will get gastroenteritis, they'll go right out the other side, um, but in some people, it can spread to the spinal cord or brain, causing all sorts of um, central nervous system problems. 
So here's a chart. Um, I've always thought that this was a really cool way to, to show um, polio. I wish they'd do more charts like this. I really feel like it shows you all of the possibilities. So in this picture, they're showing you um, on the bottom here in purple, uh, the vast majority of polio cases, what is that, something like 95% or so of polio cases are asymptomatic or mild gastroenteritis, right? Vast majority of people, that's what they exhibit. For some people, they will uh, get meningitis, right, where the bacteria is in the spinal fluid. And so you'll, it's essential cerebral spinal fluid, so you'll see that here. Some patients will exhibit that. Few patients will get minor uh, illness, but it's not central nervous system associated. And that's uh, more severe gastroenteritis. And then a very few number here you can see will wind up with permanent paralysis because of polio. Um, so it's really only a, a small minority of patients that go that route. So polio, you get by ingesting fecally contaminated food or water. Generally, it's gastroenteritis, if anything, but it can go to the spinal cord. It can go to the brain, causing long-term damage and problems. Now, we do have vaccines against polio. Um, there are two different vaccines that were created. One is an inactivated vaccine produced by a guy named Salk. The other is um, an attenuated viral vaccine, and it's an oral vaccine, and that was made by Sabin. Um, the two of them that created this vaccine were rivals, and they always uh, kind of talked smack about each other's vaccines, um, but they are both very effective. There were some problems from time to time with the uh, Sabin vaccine because uh, it did back mutate once, but uh, it is a very effective, both of them are very effective vaccines. Now, in this country, we used to vaccinate people against polio, but now, because of the way polio is acquired through ingestion of contaminated food or water, and because of our sewage treatment and food safety standards, you really don't get polio in the United States anymore. And so the CDC went through and analyzed um, what kinds of vaccine, or, or the, the risks and the benefits of the polio vaccine and decided to stop recommending it. So they no longer recommend the polio vaccine. Um, you only get it now if you're going to a part of the world that's considered high risk. Now, polio is actually the second disease that they are attempting to eradicate through vaccination. Anybody remember what the first disease was that they eradicated off the safe face of the planet? Smallpox. Smallpox was eradicated um, through a vaccination campaign. Um, polio was the next one that they wanted to set their sights on that they were trying to eradicate through a vaccination attempt. Um, now polio is much harder though because remember for smallpox every single person who's infected shows symptoms and um, it's only found in humans. There's no other reservoir. So it was relatively easy to get rid of smallpox but for polio Miss, most people are asymptomatic, and it could be sitting around in the water and the food supply, so it's much harder to get rid of polio. So what they wanted to do was to vaccinate everybody. That was the idea behind polio. Um, so they're attempting to eradicate it now through a vaccination campaign. Um, they vaccinated everybody they had easy access to, which was um, most parts of the world, but there were a few parts of the world where they couldn't get in to vaccinate against polio. Um, and so right now they still haven't quite gotten everyone, so it's not gone yet, unfortunately. There's some, still some parts of the world where we see polio cases. Uh, so they didn't make their 2010 deadline, since we're almost at the end of 2010. I can tell you they're not going to make it. Um, but they are still actively working towards eradicating polio, trying to get rid of it, uh, since it can cause permanent um, damage to the central nervous system and even death. All right. The last pathogen that I'm going to talk about this semester is a prion. But before I talk about prions, I have to kind of tell you to put everything that you now know about pathogens on hold and let me tell you about a very strange, strange thing. Prions are not viruses. Prions are infectious proteins which I know is crazy idea, crazy to think about it, but the prion is actually not a virus. 
It's not a bacteria, it's just a protein. Um, and that protein is, is the damage. Is, it causes the infection, cause, well, not the infection, but causes the damage and therefore the death uh, during a prion disease. Now I have at the end here that's not a virus, it's an infectious protein probably because there are some people who think there's probably a very, 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 very small virus that people have, I haven't identified yet, uh, but those people are kind of um, few and far between. The vast majority of scientists now agree that the prion is actually the protein itself that's causing the problem. So let me tell you how this works. Um, you have a protein in your brain called a prion. Um, and this is, and the, well, the protein that we're talking about is called PRP. It's capital P, lowercase r, capital P. Now, PRP is a normal human brain protein. It's not only found in humans, in fact, it's found in other animals as well. Lots of mammals have PRP in their brain. Normal, we expect it to be there, uh, it should be there. What happens, however, is if that protein becomes misshapen, it no longer functions correctly. That's when you wind up with this disease. So it's if your normal brain protein becomes misshapen. Remember from chemistry that for proteins, shape is everything. And if you change the shape, the protein no longer does what it's supposed to do. So this is a misshapen version of a normal brain protein. Now, unfortunately, if you have your regular, normal PRP proteins, healthy PRP proteins, if they become exposed to a misshapen PRP, then they become misshapen too. In other words, your normal proteins will see that misshapen protein and say, ooh, that looks like fun, I want to be shaped like that too, and they change shape. So the really nefarious activity here is if you have one misshapen protein, it causes all of your other proteins to become misshapen. That's the really scary part of these diseases. So again, normal brain protein called PRP, if it becomes misshapen, it can then activate all of the other proteins to become misshapen. Um, and once they're misshapen, they kind of aggregate together in these great big clusters, these great big lesions we call plaques, uh, and they cause these spongy lesions in the brain tissue. Here's a uh, normal brain tissue. Here's a uh, brain tissue with a prion disease. You can see these spongy lesions. That's actually a whole bunch of the misshapen proteins all grouped together. Uh, that's what's forming those spongy lesions. And you can imagine that spongy lesions in the brain tissue is going to cause neural symptoms, right? You're going to wind up with dementia, memory loss, impaired senses, delirium, um, senility, and death eventually with prion diseases. So prion diseases cause your, your brain proteins to become misshapen. They aggregate together and form these lesions in the brain. Now, how do you get uh, prion diseases? If prion diseases aren't caused by a virus and they aren't caused by a bacteria, how do you get them? Well, you have to be, you have to have contact with the misshapen protein because you already have the protein in your brain, but if you, if your brain proteins come into contact with one misshapen version, they can then become misshapen themselves. So how do you get contact with this misshapen brain protein? Um, you can get this by ingestion. If you ingest the brain or spinal tissue of a, an animal or a human uh, who, who has this prion disease, then that can cause the prion disease in you. So ingestion of brain or spinal tissue. Transplantation, there's been a couple of cases where eye transplants or corneal transplants have transplanted the protein from one person where it was misshapen into another. There's also genetic versions of these diseases um, where you have um, an allele that is making it more likely for you to get this misshapen version of your proteins. And then the really scary one is spontaneous. Um, in other words, we don't know what happens. For some reason, we don't understand. Your, bro your brain proteins seem fine one day, and the next day they become misshapen, and we have no idea why. Um, that's spontaneous. 
uh, development of these prion diseases. In all cases, prion diseases are chronic and fatal. When you have misshapen brain proteins that aggregate together into a lesion, that's the beginning of the end. There's nothing we can do about that. Now we see these prion diseases in both animals and humans. Some examples of animal diseases, scrapie. Scrapie is a disease we find in sheep, um, and this is a prion disease where the, the brain proteins in the sheep are misshapen and forming those spongy lesions. They call the disease scrapie because, because of the um, effect on the brain, the, mal the, the defects in the brain, the sheep, for whatever reason, feel itchy and they will scrape themselves on fence posts and things like that and tree trunks and they'll scrape themselves so hard and so many times that they actually scrape off the surface layer of skin. Um, so they call it scrapie and it's not seen in sheep. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy is seen in cows, better known as mad cow disease. Um, that is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, and that is a prion disease where the cow's brain proteins have become misshapen and they're aggregating together into these spongy lesions and it's causing brain damage and eventually death in the cows. In uh, North America, we see what's called chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease is found in both wild deer and elk and moose now populations. Um, where the animals are suffering from another prion disease, damage to the brain. Now, how do sheep and cows get these prion diseases? It seems to have happened because uh, some ranchers, if, if an animal died, they would grind up the dead animal and put it in the other animal's feed. The idea being to supplement the feed with extra protein and vitamins, etc. Well, unfortunately, if the cow died and it died because of a prion disease, you've just ground up its brain and spinal tissue and put it into the feed for the other cows. So you're spreading the mad cow. Um, that practice has now been outlawed in the United States, which will drastically reduce the occurrence um, of bovine spongiform encephalopathy in countries that have outlined it, outlawed it. There are human versions of these diseases as well. Um, the first one identified is called Kuru. Kuru is a prion disease that's seen in um, some parts of the world in, in certain, let's see, it's in New Guinea, that's the island where it is. Um, and in certain tribes in New Guinea, it is uh, tradition for family members to eat the body of their dead relatives. So if the relative dies out of, to pay respect to that relative, they eat the body of the relative. Um, well, if you're eating brain or spinal tissue from somebody who had a prion disease, you're going to wind up with it. So Kuru is an ingested transmission um, from a human. There's also some genetic versions. Fatal familial insomnia um, is seen in a, in a handful of families of Italian descent uh, where they have a particular um, genetic predisposition to, to forming these uh, misformed brain proteins. The most common of human prion diseases is called creutzfeldt jakob uh, creutzfeldt jakob disease is, is the most common prion disease where the brain proteins have been misshapen and aggregate into spongy lesions. Um, what can cause creutzfeldt jakob First, uh, here, the one that we always think of, because we heard so much press about it, is infectious creutzfeldt jakob Infectious creutzfeldt jakob comes from ingesting cows or sheep brain or spinal tissue. Uh, so you may think, well, when I don't eat the brain, I don't eat the spinal tissue. Yeah, well, if you're eating a hamburger, it's likely to have some brain or spinal tissue in it. Um, because of the way the butchery process works. So uh, infectious creutzfeldt jakob usually comes from ingesting food that has brain or spinal tissue in it from a cow or a sheep. There's a genetic version of creutzfeldt jakob where if you have uh, the particular allele, then you are going to develop creutzfeldt jakob later in life. They do have ways to test for that. Uh, families where they know creutzfeldt jakob runs in the family, they can test you to see if you carry it, if you want to be tested. Uh, probably scarily, um, actually the most common way to acquire creutzfeldt jakob disease is completely spontaneously, which I know is scary. Um, 
In fact, for most people, we have no idea why you got Kreutzfeldt Jakob. It was a spontaneous change. We doesn't appear that you ate anything. Doesn't appear that you have any genetic predisposition. Um, but apparently, you uh, are, are one of the unlucky ones where your brain proteins, for whatever reason, just decided to change shape into this other shape, and then you wind up with Kreutzfeldt Jakob. Um, I know it's kind of a scary phenomenon. We have no idea why it happens. It's, it's uh, listed as spontaneous until we learn more. All right, this brings us to the end of the material for the final exam. Um, I will see you guys in lab, and we'll talk more about the final. Um, so I will see you soon.